Our first question, and I hope the picture comes up in a minute here, is from Lori in West Lynn. And um, she has some beautiful lupin, which has white stuff all over the leaves, a very common problem this time of the year in the garden. That powdery stuff is um, powdery mildew. It has a wide range of plants it likes to invade. It's a fungus. Uh, you've often seen it on squash plants, the leaves of squash, squash and other ornamentals like um, Monarda loves to do on Mia and Columbine. Uh, fungicide works well if you anticipate its arrival. Uh, works better if you know about the powdery mildew coming before it happens. Um, but you can use it every seven to 14 days if you choose to go that route. You can also try and space your plants so that you have good air circulation. It happens much less if you have lots of space between the plants and you can see that they're a little bit close together. But this time of the year, perennials do that. Um, just remember, things are beginning to die back now. We're gonna have some cool temperatures. When, when they do, make sure and clean up the area so no, no spores are left laying around the ground to reinfect next spring. Next spring, they'll come up, they'll be beautiful, and you'll um, just remember that timing so that if you choose to use a fungicide, you do it before the uh, powdery mildew emerges. Thanks, Lori, for your question. Okay. I have an apple problem that I needed to take care of. This question about her apples came from Chris in West Lynn. Unfortunately, these apples have several problems going on all at the same time. So the first picture, the next picture, will show you an apple that has these indentation marks all around the apple. That is called bitter pit. This is a physiological disorder and it's due to a calcium deficiency in the fruit itself. There's a lot of ways you can take care of this. Um, there's a lot of cultural practices and some other type of practices, some chemicals that you could use. But the main thing is if you go to the link at the bottom of this, this slide, it has a lot of information that I can't go through completely right now. We've had a lot of hot, dry weather this summer and that tends to increase the incidence of bitter pit. She also asked if these apples are edible. Um, yes, they are edible, but because of the name, they will have a bitter taste to them. So that is just one of the things that she had going on with her apple. The next photo shows a hole in the very bottom of the apple. This is caused from a coddling moth. And coddling moth is one of the most damaging insects that we have in our home orchard. And the larva will enter the apple through the middle and then go into the core. And while it's in the core of the apple, it will pupate and then it will emerge through the bottom of the apple as the moth, as, a, as it is a moth. So that's the coddling moth. Now there are traps and there are other cultural practices that you can use. And once again, the website at the bottom of this page has a lot of good information about it. Now, the third problem she had with her apples isn't quite as much of a problem as the other two, and that is apple scab. A lot of different varieties of apples have apple scab. It is only on the surface, so if that's the only problem that your apple has, you can easily cut that part off and the apple will be completely, completely edible. So there's a lot of information from Oregon State University and Portland State University on problems with apples. So the next one is yours, Cheryl. Thanks, Jane. Now this is a question that a lot of you are gonna be able to relate to. Our summer was hot and a couple of days were brutally hot. And uh, Joy and Westland said, what is wrong with my, what should I do about the crinkled leaves on my Japanese maple? And my grand fir tree is, pretty red with uh, sun scald. Well, uh, the stress and the drought conditions that we've had over the last few summers are really, really beginning to stress our trees. Japanese maples 
particularly hard hit. You know, their root zone goes out a great deal farther than the tree itself. And uh, you, you really need to add uh, water as much as you possibly can to keep the root zone moist because the tree cannot uptake enough moisture to support the entire canopy of the tree. So the tips of the leaves and the top crown are gonna be affected. This tree, if it gets adequate water, will survive this uh, unsightly period. And by next spring, it'll leaf out beautifully. Just remembering if we again have a very, very dry summer, it's going to need additional water. It can't survive on its own with just existing groundwater. Leave the tips alone, don't try to prune. The grand fir trees, which are beauties and have gotten terrible amount of sun scald, um, don't attempt to remove the, the sun scalded branches or anything. A fir tree of any type needs about one to three inches of water a week. So keep that in mind. It's best applied with a soaker hose or some slow drip method so that the plant can uptake it. None of it runs off the root zone. Um, fall rains are coming. I heard that on the news. <laughs> there is hope. So hopefully um, we won't have a 115 degree temperatures next summer. Thanks, Chris. Uh, back to you, Jane. Okay, this beautiful home belongs to a lady named Tammy. She lives in West Lynn. Tammy has heard that cover crops are a good way to help improve your soil. But unfortunately, she has all ornamental plants and not a vegetable garden. And you can see from this photo that all of her plants are so close together that she would be very hard to be able to plant a cover crop back inside. Uh, between those plants. Cover crops are mainly used for vegetable gardens and in areas where, the, where you have a vegetable garden, you plant your cover crop in late summer and then it grows through the winter and then you cut it down in the spring. And then you either till it in or use a spading fork and you incorporate that cover crop into the soil. And what it does, cover crops enrich the soil with nutrients but the other thing cover crops do is it helps cover that bare soil all during the winter time. Um, now, if since she has just ornamental plants and trees and things, the best way that she can do to help prove her soil would be to add some type of mulch or compost within between all of those plants. And as they break down themselves, then they will incorporate some good nutrients and organic matter into the soil. But so if you are considering using a cover crop on your vegetable garden, the links below, the links on this slide will give you that information. And the, the last link on the slide will also tell you about how to improve your soil using other organic matters such as Tammy will need to do in her landscape. Okay, back to you, Cheryl. Okay. All right. How many of you have a beautiful hot lip salvia in your yard? And it's getting huge because it's just like loving it, <laughs> this weather. Um, well, Chris and Westland says hers is not only um, abundant, it's on to her neighbor's property. And she said, what should I do? Should I whack it? What should I do? Okay. So, uh, you know, you don't want to prune it too much because it can be uh, frost damaged. Um, if you prune it real severely too early. So I would say, you know, of course, prune it back off and get it into your own yard again, but don't do it so harshly that new growth is stimulated because that will be really um, vulnerable to freezing. But it's when, when, the, when things get very cool, you can, even the springtime, you can prune it down six to eight inches of the soil. And then if you prune it down in the uh, spring and it's up in July, you might consider pruning again. It kind of keeps the size in control and it'll allow for more blooms and you won't have to worry about your neighbors getting your hot lip sally all over their sidewalk. There is a link there for the care of perennials if you're interested in more information. And am I next, Jane, or are you next? You have another one to go. Okay, this is Mike. I love, Mike went for a stroll in his Happy Valley neighborhood and he saw some trees and shrubs that he thought were pretty interesting and had no idea what they were. It was kind of a fun exercise for me. Um, this first picture is of the European larch. It's a Larix decidua. It's an unusual conifer, and you can tell by the needles how they kind of spiral around the stem. Beautiful cones that are very upright. This um, will turn yellow as we get later into the fall, and all the needles will drop and then reemerge in green in the springtime. 
is this is a beautiful specimen so he did a good job of locating a good one and his photos are great his photos were great this is a kusa dogwood very very popular it's not our native dogwood it blooms about one month later than our native dogwood um, people like it because it's small to medium size so it's a good landscape plant flowers in, in a gorgeous way in the springtime and uh, there's more, and it's also disease resistant. Native dogwoods tend to get anthracnose, which makes the leaves unsightly. So um, the Kusa has been a, a strong choice for, for urban gardeners particularly. And there's more in that link about the uh, Kusa dogwood. Now this was a head scratcher. We got to talk to lots of people before we figured out what this one was. This is the Angelica tree or the Aurelia elata. And uh, it's a deciduous multi-stemmed shrub or tree. It typically grows about 20 feet tall. It's drought tolerant and does not mind a lot. It's got a wide range of soil types it will tolerate, although it prefers moist, well-drained soil. It has 12 to 18 inch flowers that bloom from July to August. And that um, it can be, a, as you probably notice, there's a lot of other shrubberies around this pretty dense planting, but it's a little bit aggressive, so. Um, Think about that before you might plant that little thing. And this is the Pyracantha uh, coquinea. It's orange glow. It's a broadleaf member of the rose family. And you can see that it's prized for the beautiful berries. And this is dramatic, it kind of draping over that gray fence makes it look really, really beautiful. It's a multi stemmed evergreen shrub and it bears a lot of fruit. I'm sure the birds love it. It's pretty dramatic. Okay, back to you, Jane. All right. This question also came from Chris in West Lynn. She has this strawberry patch and she was asking, what can I do with my strawberries now in the fall? The problem is she combined her June bearing strawberries and her day neutral strawberries and day neutrals are strawberries, which put on a little bit of strawberries through the whole growing season. She combined these both in the same strawberry patch. And unfortunately, the problem with that is that those two types of strawberries that you'll see in the next photo have different needs. The June bearing strawberries, what they need to do, they need to put out a lot of runners. That's that little branch that you see come out of the main strawberry. And what they do, those runners will put out new plants and that's how you increase your yield and you increase the amount of strawberries you have in your patch. They also need to be fertilized after they're done producing. You don't, you don't fertilize June bearing strawberries at other times of the year. You do it after they're done producing, probably about the end of June or the beginning of July. Then the day neutral strawberries, which she has in with her June berries, they should not be allowed to put out runners. This type of strawberry, since it does produce fl uh, flowers and fruit all season long, it needs to come from the mother plant. And if it, this one is putting out new plants, the energy is going to go into the new plant and not into the mother plant, which is producing the fruit. The other thing about the day neutrals is because they are growing all season long, they need to be fertilized more frequently, not just after the growing season, but more frequently all through the growing season. So Chris has a dilemma here. It's hard to tell which strawberry is which. Right now, if her day neutral ones are still producing some fruit, mine are, which I just had some nice strawberries yesterday, if she can tell that that is a day neutral plant, she could dig it up now and transplant it to someplace else. The other only thing she could probably do would be to start a new patch, start two new patches, and when the new strawberries come in in March, she'll just have to start over. So that's the end of our questions for today. We hope that all of you will tune in for the next four Saturdays to come at the same time. And if you have more gardening questions, just about general things like Cheryl and I had answered today, please do send them. Go on to the seamastergardeners.org and put in some information and we'll hopefully get back to you next week. If we have more questions than we can answer, we will send, we will email those answers to you specifically. So thank you everyone for attending.